Good morning, good morning. Good morning, church. All right, we get one good morning from Jan. Yes, you're with me, all right. Awesome, hello everyone online. Thanks for joining us this morning. All right, how we doing? Good. Just, that was like even hard to believe. Was it good? Are you all right, Tony? Doing okay? All right, well, what I would love for us to do is just start off this morning on our feet because we are going to be praising the King. Is that okay? Does that sound like a good way to start off Sunday morning church? I love it. Amen, amen. Father God, thank you that we can gather. Jesus, gather and lift up your name this morning. Jesus, Jesus. Bring hope to the hopeless and light To those in the darkness and death To light Now I know that You bring peace to the restless and joy To homes that are broken Oh, 
won't shadow, you won't light up Mountain, you won't climb up Coming after me So no wall, you won't kick down Now you won't tear down Coming after me Let's sing this truth this morning so no shadow, you won't light up Mountain, you won't climb up Hallelujah. Cause no wall you won't kick down, now you won't
Father, we're thankful for your reckless love for us. Can you take your cup this morning? If you don't have one, raise your hand. It's Communion Sunday. If you're at home watching, it's Communion Sunday. So I don't know if we gave you a warning or not, but first Sunday of the month. Hey, as we're singing these songs this morning, I was just thinking what this cup represents for us. It's a cup of freedom because we sing the words, God, you open the door for me and you lay down your life to set me free. That's a cup of freedom. This cup represents an invitation because the second song we sang is, there were walls between us, but by the cross you came and you broke them down. God, you invited me in. It's a cup that represents relationship. Because as the parable says that he left the 99 and came after the one. He came after you to invite you into relationship with him and his heavenly father. And when we drink this cup, when we eat the bread, Jesus says, remember what I've done for you. This is no little thing. It's not a religious thing. It's relationship. It's an invitation to freedom. If you've never experienced the freedom of Jesus, you can experience that today. Not by drinking this cup or eating the bread, but by saying yes to him and inviting him in to your life. Take the bread this morning, would you? We're going to do this together today. And I just want you to take a moment and give thanks. Jesus said that this bread represents his body that was broken for you. That he willingly went through on your behalf. So give him thanks this morning for this bread. Thank you, Lord. I love it, church. Whisper your prayers. That's so good that we can hear one another just reaching out to Jesus this morning, giving him thanks. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, God, so much for what you've done for us, Lord. Remind us often, remind us daily that you are the bread of life. Thank you for giving us this day our daily bread. We give you thanks for your body that was broken on our behalf, Lord Jesus. And we take this bread in remembrance of you. Can we eat the bread together? Jesus then took the cup a cup that they had drank an often from. It says, every time you drink from now on, I want you to remember that this cup represents the blood that will be spilt on your behalf. So take a moment and thank him for the shedding of his blood for us, the shedding of his blood for you. Give him thanks this morning. God, we make room for you this morning, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Can I invite you to whisper? I know we're in church and we're like, well, we pray one at a time. Ah, oh, no, we don't. Let's whisper our prayers to the Lord this morning in thanksgiving. God, God, thank you so much. Just whisper your, whisper your prayers out loud. God, thank you so much for doing this for us, Lord God. I 
thank you, Lord, so much for all that you've done. God, thank you for all that you're doing. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for introducing us to Abba, Father. Not a distant, far off God, but a God who is close. We thank you for your blood spilt for us, Jesus. And we remember what you've done for us. Let's take the cup.
Together, the church agreed and said, Amen. Amen, Father God. Whew, what a good God we serve. What a good God we worship. And that we're able to just freely be in his presence. Amen. Amen, amen. Take a moment. Let's greet a neighbor. Meet a stranger. We're going to continue in just a bit. Good morning. You know, it's so much fun. It's so much fun to greet 
everyone. I was thinking this morning, it's so much fun to greet everyone that when we first get to heaven, we're going to spend probably a few thousand years <laughs> hugging and loving on each other. Isn't that going to be awesome? Well, I'm Pastor Jan, and I'm doing announcements this morning. Um, good to have you all here, those who join us online. And the big event is almost here, the third children's ministry outreach summer splash and that's august 21st from six to eight come you know they, they feed us really really well hamburgers hot dogs you know you name it and, and pickles for the pickle crowd okay good but this is an awesome opportunity to bring your your neighbor uh your your kids come and just um, have fun together, and, and that's, that's so awesome. So that's August 21st. That following Sunday, we do have potluck, the 25th of August. That's awesome. And we will have adult Sunday school. We've just been doing it once a month on the fourth Sunday, just to touch base and, again, just love on one another and study the Word. So August 25th. Uh, nine o'clock in the morning, right, right here. So come for that. Um, and then we're so blessed to be able to give tithes and offerings. And the Lord spoke something to my heart. And he said, well, what does blessed really mean? So of course, you know, I'm, I'm on that trail. And I found out that the word blessed means in Hebrew to bow the knee. When we come and we need a blessing, what do we need to do? We need to bow the knee, to humble ourselves and seek God. And then his blessings are poured out. So as we give, let's, let's do it with that thankful heart, acknowledging that the source of everything that's good in our lives comes from the Lord. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us this opportunity to give to you. And we bring it, Lord. We lay it on the altar to bless you and, Lord, to, to bless the people in our community, our church, missions around the world, Lord God. Um, we, we do these things because you pour out beyond all that we can ask or think. So thank you, Father, for that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Bless this Amen. service. Pastor Kevin, good Amen. to have you. Amen. Coming I'm, up this morning. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. Awesome. Hey, it was super sweet to have a bunch of under 20-somethings leading worship this morning. Wasn't that cool? I mean, there's a few um, over 20s on the stage, but... I average it out, so it's about 45. Of, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for um, leading this morning. It was super sweet. Um, I want to pray for the under 20s to this morning. And I, I include, I also going to say teenagers. Well, she's still 20. Yeah, under 20. Yeah, yeah. So I was going to include, say, just teenagers, but Michael, who was up here, is actually 20. So she's getting ready to turn 21, so I'm going to say 20 and under. I want to pray for this generation just real quick um, because our future in Christ is really in their hands, right? Amen. And so if we don't give them opportunity to serve, if we don't give them opportunity to grow in their relationship with Jesus, then they won't be ready to serve and they won't be ready to um, to step into that place for such a time as this. And so Pastor Marcy, who's actually in the house this morning, I don't even know what to think about that. Um, she's not teaching today, so pressure's on when she's in, in the room. Um, but she has her volunteers teaching our kids this morning in different classrooms all throughout the building, um, raising up this generation to know Jesus. And so that they know him so well that they will follow him and do the things that He's asking them and calling them to do. So can we pray? Can you pray for the less than 20s this morning? 
And here's my challenge for those of you who are under 20. Would you pray for those who are over 20 that are in this room? Seriously. Yes. Please. Let's pray for one another today. For those who are watching at home, we're praying for you as well this morning. So let's lift up our prayers before the Lord this morning. The Bible describes them as incense. That is a sweet aroma and fragrance to God as we worship him in prayer. Yes, Lord. And God, we do bow the knee this morning, Jesus. And Lord, for this generation who is rising up, statistics say, doctors say, specialists say, it is the most anxious and depressed generation ever. And Lord, we speak against that this morning in Jesus' name. That you'd replace anxiousness with peace. Because you are the prince of peace. And that you'd replace depression, Lord Jesus, with joy. With clarity. Knowing that their future is not what they make it, which is what they're told, but it is what you have made for them. And so, Lord, we pray that they would bow their knee before you and they would follow you with all their heart, with all their soul. God, with their minds and with every bit of strength that they have, they would follow you. Lord, we pray that for the over 20s as well. Lord, that we won't worry, that we won't fear about what tomorrow holds or what's going to happen tomorrow or how our end may be. And that we would trust you. Today, right now, we would put our trust in, in you. Break down the walls today, Lord Jesus. We don't want tradition. We don't want religion. We want you. And so we make room for you today. And we pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Hey, next week, a bunch of us are out of town. Because you know what happens in August. Everybody just says, deuces, we're gone. (laughs) And that's what happens. And so... Uh, A bunch of people are gone next Sunday, and so Ashley, who normally leads worship, will usually ask Brandon, well, Brandon's gone, so then she will usually ask me, we're gone. And so she asked my parents. So they're going to lead next week, and so I know I'm going to disappoint Michael and many others, no banjo next week. There's no banjo, just, just rock and roll guitar. Um, bass and drums, right? Yep. A little bit? No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Come to church, okay. <laughs> there you go. Right from her mouth, not mine. Okay. She's going to be our new advertiser. Uh, yeah, she's going to be. She, she, yeah, mom, mama, says, mama says don't stay home. <laughs> go to church. Yes, yeah. Mama said. That's from a movie, right? Okay, anyways. Um, so, yeah, so please come. And then... Uh, Pastor Alex is going to speak next Sunday and share out of the, out, out of the, uh, he's going to talk about one of the parables. It's going to be really sweet. So please come. It's a bummer that we have to go away for cool things to happen. So maybe we just need to go away more often. So cool, more cool things will happen. Yes. I vote yes. Okay. All right. Hey, we're talking about stories. Everybody loves a good story. And I don't know where you land on the story spectrum. Like, do you like fiction? 
Do you like nonfiction, historical? Do you like sci-fi, fantasy? <sighs> There's so many. Adventure, intrigue. Fiction. Who likes fiction? Raise your hand. Okay. I just laugh at this row right over here because okay. we need to get like a little booth over there. Okay. Now, we're okay. the people that Paul was talking about. We're the old Muppets. Yes, you, you guys are the old two. You remember the show with like, the two old guys on the Muppet show? Okay, anyways. I can only say that because we, we know each other. Okay. Okay, anyways. I love them. Love them, love them. Okay, so fiction, yes. How about I call it factual, nonfiction? Nonfiction people? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a nonfiction. How about like historical? Like, like true history stuff. You know, Tony, for sure. I know Dana Buck has a whole library full of, if you want to know like history stuff, he's, he's the man. How about sci-fi? Okay. Just keep your hands up over there. So that, that's, that seems to be the theme. How about adventure? Adventure? Some of you aren't raising your hands at all. You're like, kind of like me, like books. Oops. I don't want to read books. <laughs> I read one book. It's the book. And so, uh, no, stories are amazing. It's, it's what we kind of captures our hearts. It's what draw us to. Um, sometimes we use stories to escape, to get away. And so Jesus uses stories to illustrate truth. Jesus brought stories that would show us and introduce us to his Father in heaven. Jesus used stories to illustrate truth to us and compare things. He would use analogies to bring truth to us, things like everyday things that we experience, everything, everyday things that we would go through, he would use those things. And over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at the different stories, the different parables that Jesus told. The word parable in Greek means to come alongside, to throw alongside. And so I'm going to bring, Jesus says, I'm going to bring something that you guys see all the time, and I'm going to bring truth right into it. Amen. And what it does, the stories help us remember truth. And so that's why Jesus shared his stories. And we looked at last week. Sometimes Jesus hid truth in the midst of his stories and made us think, made us like push through all the stuff like, and really like with our whole heart, seek after what is true in the story. On our most recent camping trip with the, the junior hires and high schoolers, I kind of went old school with him, and I said, hey, this is going to be different. We're going to really be serious about our relationship with Jesus, even in the woods. And so what we did is a half an hour before our campfire, which is usually for us, that's probably one of the best times of the day, is our campfire times. And so we would send them out. We'd meet at 8.15, and we'd send them out, and we bought them books. It was called New Morning Mercies. And it's, it's a devotional for every single day of the year. And so we happen to show up on July 14th. And so, hey, tonight, before we meet at campfire, I want you to go spend a half an hour with Jesus. I want you to pray. I want you to read this book. I want you to ask him what he's saying in this particular chapter, in this typical devotion. And then we'll come back together, and we're going to have some time of worship and song around the campfire. And we're going to discuss this book. I particularly really like this writer. His name is Paul David Tripp. Because he writes different. And so one of the first feedbacks from the very first night from several people in the group was, I don't really like it. I don't really care for his style of writing. And my response was, because what he would do is he would take normal, regular ideas that we kind of face and struggle with, and he would word them in such a way where you had to think as you read through. It wasn't just like this. Per it wasn't like a Max Lucado, you know, sunset and walks on the beach and everything almost rhymes. 
And it was like, okay, that felt so good to read. You have to work at reading his stuff. And sometimes you have to read it, and then you have to shake your head and like, okay, I need to read that again. And so, but the more we did that throughout the week, it did change us. It did move us because it forced us to lean in and press into Jesus. Say, I want to understand this truth, but I don't necessarily understand it. So I need you to help me. And so as we read these stories over the next several weeks, even months, my prayer is that we will understand as we lean in and press in that Jesus will still today enlighten us. That his Holy Spirit will reveal truth to us and help us to walk these truths out. First of all, for us to understand them, but to live them. Jesus just doesn't want to fill our heads with knowledge. He wants us to live it in front of people. And I believe in front of our family first and then to everybody else. Because if we're not living for Jesus with our families, then we're missing something. Family first. Walk with Jesus with your family. Huge. Jesus reminds us through these truths that God is close to us. It's the exact opposite of what the religious teachers were teaching of the day. That God is distant, far off, unapproachable. And Jesus came to tell us that he's right here. And I want to introduce him to you. One of the things that the Jewish people got right was the reverence of God. And I think sometimes we fall on the other side. And we're so casual with God. We forget that he is a God who is holy. That without Jesus coming and dying for us, he was unapproachable. But Jesus opened the door. And when Hebrews says that not only did he open the door, that he invites us in. And we don't have to come in crawling on our hands and knees. There's a reverence part, yes, 100%. But he says we can boldly come and do this and approach his throne of grace. And we can receive mercy exactly when we need it. Anybody need mercy today? Then you can boldly approach the throne of God. And he, he invites you in. And he will give you mercy. They were being taught different. And that's why we, what I love about that bridge of that song. God, just throw away our traditions. All the, even all our, some of the thoughts, the preconceived thoughts that we had of you and teach us and show us. And so that is, again, that is my prayer as we look at these parables. And if you've been a believer like me for a long time, I was adding it up the other day. It's like, wow, that's a long time to know Jesus. I've read these stories for over 40 years. But what I'm praying is, God, would you show us new because he's not a God who just created and finished. He continually creates, I believe. And he still has new things for us every single day as we press in. And so I pray that we would press in. I think one of my favorite stories, types, is hero stories. When the, I was going to say when the good guy wins, but when the good person wins. When the good side wins. And it might look treacherous for a while, but then there's always, it's the good ending. It's the hallmark ending, right? Good happens at the very end. Something, a hero shows up. Even an unlikely hero. And I was thinking about this week, and so I looked up, what are some unlikely heroes? And you type that in. I mean, <laughs> there's thousands of just everyday people who stop and intervene. Here's one. Mamadou Gassama. 
He was a migrant worker from Africa living in France, just struggling day by day. He's 22 years old. He's walking down the streets, and he hears all this screaming and this crowd gathering underneath a four-story building. And he looks up, and there's a, about a three-year-old hanging from the balcony. Now, it's kind of weird. If you look up the video, look up the video. Not now, Pete, but <laughs> l l later. Or now, that's fine, OK? There's, like, his parents are right, the, the kid's parents are, like, right there. I don't know why they don't just reach down and grab him. I think they're afraid to. So they're just, mom and dad are kind of just up there looking down, and this poor little kid is four stories, 40 feet up, just hanging on like this. And what does Mamadou do? He actually climbs the outside of the building. He jumps up on the first little balcony, and then he climbs up the rails and gets on top and climbs up. It's like Spider-Man. And he gets up there, and I, it's just, it's weird. If you watch the video, he just reaches over, grabs the kid by one hand, and flings him right up into the balcony. Saved, rescued, and he's just, and he's done. It's an incredible hero story, from, and especially an unlikely migrant worker, right? No one would ever expect this to happen. But he was a gifted young man in his physical abilities, but also in action. Like, how am I going to rescue and save this boy? Not even thinking about, well, what if I fall down? He just did it. And because he did that, now he's one of the 24 trainees in the f fireman brigade in France. It's pretty cool. I just saw another unlikely hero movie this week. It's based on a true story. Her name was Francesca Cabrini. And she was a young nun in Italy. Anybody know the story? Raise your hand if you know the story. So only a couple of you, so I'm telling you this for the first time. It's actually a movie. And so if you like going to the movies and reading, this, this would be the perfect movie for you. Because there's a lot of subtitles. But there is some English in it, so that's, that's good. You, you can pick up some. But she was a young woman who was a nun who had dedicated her life to God. And she had this big heart for children of the world, the orphans of the world. And she wanted to start in China. But being a woman, being a nun, she went to her superiors and they said no. And you know what they told her? They told her to stay in her lane. And not in the way we're like, hey, we're running together, not that type of lane, just, no, you stay, we'll tell you what to do, basically, is what they told her. She really felt God was calling her, like, I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to do this. So she kept appealing until she got to meet with the Pope face to face. And the Pope said, all right, I love your vision, but we're going to start with the biggest need first, and we're going to start in New York City. Because all these Italian immigrants had gone to New York City, and there was no American dream there. It was poverty. They were dying. Their kids were being orphaned. Their kids were living literally in the sewers of New York City. And so they said, go there first. And so she humbly, with, a long, with, with about seven or eight of her nun friends, got on the boat and came to the United States. And they served. And again, she faced opposition after opposition after opposition. Had to get on the boat and go back over several times to appeal until by the time she passed away, 67 institutions that had been started all over the world, including China, including India, including the United States, including Seattle. She started a hospital right here in Seattle. It's an incredible story of an unlikely hero. And the whole time she faced, when she was doing this, she faced a severe illness. She almost drowned when she was a teenager. So she had this severe lung and heart issue that would take her out for days sometimes. But she still pressed on and trusted God. Heroes, unlikely heroes. Just everyday, ordinary people stepping up in the time of need. And this morning, 
we're going to look at an everyday, ordinary person who stepped up in the time of need. So open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. I didn't even bring the clicker this morning. So it's going to be really easy for our person back there in the back. He doesn't like me to say his name. So you will need a Bible today because I only have one verse on the, uh, the list here. And so raise your hand. We have Bibles. I probably should turn there myself. Luke chapter 10. It's a very familiar story. I'm actually just going to read the first few, few verses, 25 through 29, because there's a setup to this story that Jesus is going to tell. Starting in verse 25, to kind of set the scene of what's going on here. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. He says, teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So let's stop there. I want to ask us that question this morning. I believe that most of us in this room right now, we know Jesus. We've said yes to him. He has told us to obey him. We don't talk about that very often, but he does say, obey me. If you love me, you'll obey me. You'll do what I tell you to do. Be baptized. And then I want you to go and I want you to tell people about me. You realize that's one of our number one things as a believer in Christ is we're supposed to tell people about Jesus. We don't hear about that very often, but that's what we're supposed to do. Those were some of Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven. He says, I want you to go. And we, we, call, we say make disciples. And simply that just means go and tell people about me and walk with them. Live life with them. Serve and worship me together. That's making disciples. So the question this person asked Jesus is this, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And do we as believers, specifically like in this room, do we know how to answer that question? I hope we know how to answer that question. I mean, how cool would it be if you're like at Safeway and someone just comes up to you and says, hey, can you tell me how to get to heaven? Well, I just go down here and take a left. <laughs> you know, no, we got to tell them. And so do, can we, and I'm being serious about this, can we really tell them, do we give them a list? No, we point them to Jesus. Most people recognize Jesus as a good teacher. This guy did. He recognized and said, teacher, what must I do to inherit e eternal life? We should be able to tell them about Jesus. Like I said, most people recognize Jesus as a good teacher, even a prophet. And so a good teacher, a prophet, we should be doing the things that they have told us what to do. We should believe what they say. And Jesus said that he was God. Jesus said if we want relationship with God, that we have to come through him. So a relationship with God, eternal life, is in Christ. It's through Jesus. That's our answer. And it's simply saying yes to him. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes along with that, right? It's to say yes. Because Jesus responds. Jesus doesn't lay out the four spiritual laws here. Knowing, his, knowing this guy's heart, Jesus goes right at it. And Jesus says, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And Nathan, we have a slide here. I'm just going to put it up. And this is what the guy answers Jesus out of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus answered, said, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. 
Do this and you will live. I mean, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That means you're going to follow him. You're going to do the things he's called you to do. You're going to obey him. You're going to walk with him. The amazing thing is, as we do those things, he walks with us. It's not like we're doing those things alone. We, he is walking with us as we do these things, as we love him, as we serve him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then Jesus goes on. After this guy wants to clarify. Have you ever asked God a question and he gives you an answer? And then you're like, um, let me clarify. So you ask God a question. God answers. And you're like, well, maybe if I ask him again, he'll give me the answer I want. Right? And so that's what's happening here. So the person the the specialist in the law. It says, but he wanted to justify himself. And so he said, who is my neighbor? Who am I supposed to love? Who am I supposed to care for? Who am I supposed to be involved in their life? Who, who is that person? And it's from there Jesus tells us a story of an unlikely hero. And let's pick that up in verse 30. In reply, Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho <clears throat> when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite. And when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds and pouring oil and wine. And when he put the man on his own donkey, then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him to go and do likewise. Jesus asked the expert of the law, who was Jewish, out of these three who walked by the man who was beaten, who was also a fellow Jewish man, which one was his neighbor? And do you notice that the expert of the law doesn't say specifically who? Just kind of points. Because Samaritans were hated by the Jews. Hated. They were rebels. They had intermarried. They claim to worship the one true God. And Israel was like, no. They were sellouts, according to the Jewish people. So he doesn't even say, well, the Samaritan was the, the good guy here. He just was, oh, well, the one that, was, that showed mercy. So Jesus took a group of people who were disliked and turned them into heroes. And as I read through this passage, my constant question that rolls through my brain is that, who is my Samaritan? 
I mean, who is my Samaritan? I don't know if anybody of you, you guys asked that question, but it just rolls through my brain constantly as I read the story. I mean, we look and see how the other two travelers responded to their fellow countrymen laying on the side of the road. They literally crossed the road and walked on the other side. The priests, and I know there's some some Levitical laws that talk about, you know, blood and taking care of people and that that type of stuff. You have somebody dying on the side of the road, you don't cross the other side and leave them to die. It doesn't matter what color their skin is, it doesn't matter who they are, you help them. And Jesus is saying, we need to help them. And we look at how the Samaritan responded, and just to break it down to all the things that he did for this person that he didn't know, who was considered his enemy, the Samaritans didn't like the Jews either. It wasn't just one-sided. They didn't like each other. And yet, he saw the need, and he met the need. The first thing it says is that he had pity on him. That word means compassion. That that word means that he was moved, that something deep down inside of him said, I need to help. It wasn't that response of the other two that 1990s response. Anybody thinking of the 1990s response? Sucks to be you. I know, we don't say that word in church. but Some of you didn't hear it, so I'm glad you didn't hear it. We'll just move on. Okay. <laughs> Ask me later. But he had pity and compassion. And instead of crossing the other side of the road, it says right here that he went to him. Not only did he have compassion and pity and mercy, he went to him, he bandaged his wounds, used his own medicine to help. Loaded him up on his own donkey. So now he's walking. And took him and took him to a hotel. An inn is a hotel. Probably a Marriott. They're everywhere. And then pulls out of it, you know, spends the night and takes care of him, makes sure he's okay, he's stable, he's all right. But he still has a journey to go, so he tells the innkeeper, hey, here's 300 bucks. That's about how much it was. Here's $300 to somebody, for, for somebody that you don't even know. I mean, how many of us would really do that? I mean, I know there's all of you in this room, of course. But how many of us would really do that? Like, here's... Here's 300 bucks. I'm going to take care of you. And to tell the innkeeper, hey, if it goes over next time I pass through here, which I'm going to be going right by here in a few days, I'll pay the extra. Not even thinking about what it's going to cost him. His compassion and care is for the person who, is, who needed help. Jesus tells us in the story that a complete stranger, even our enemy, is our neighbor. So if we ask the question, who is my neighbor? And I'm, I, I, I don't even have this as an excuse anymore. I've been in my, our house for three years now, almost three, yeah, three years. Come on, yeah, I think trying to do the math, okay, about three years. Can't reach math. And I know my, some of my neighbors It helps that the neighbor on both sides of our house, the guy's name is the same, so Daniel and Daniel. That's, <laughs> got it? You know, and Daniel's married to Donna, and then across the street we have Debbie and Terry, and then across the street we have Margie and Greg. And that's it. One house removed, I have no idea. 
I see him once in a while. I've waved at him a couple times. News travels out there so they know what I, who I am and what I do, but I don't know them or what they do. And so to answer this question for us, even in our today world, is like, who is our neighbor? I mean, do we even know the people that live right next to us? Maybe we should. Who is our neighbor? In this case, Jesus says a complete stranger is our neighbor. Somebody who is not even like us, who doesn't look like us, doesn't worship like us, doesn't act like us, doesn't talk like us. They're still our neighbor. And because of the story, today when we think of Samaritan, we usually think good. Unless you watch the Sylvester Stallone movie called Samaritan. It's only three stars. Don't waste your time. Okay? I haven't seen it, but anyways, I might want to see it. But anyways. But we think good. When you think of Samaritan, you think good. There's a hospital in Puyallup. And what is it called? It's called Good Samaritan. There's a great ministry run by Franklin Graham. And it's called Samaritan's Purse. So the Samaritan in the story takes out his purse and he gives money to take care of the one who is in need. So this ministry is called Samaritan's Purse. So when we think of the word Samaritan now, we think of someone who is compassionate, someone who is generous, someone who is kind. So again, I want to ask us the question is, who is our neighbor? I believe that our neighbor is everyone we come in contact with, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their religion, regardless of their economic status, regardless of their affiliation. I'm going to ask you a question this morning, and I'm, normally I like to be kind of interactive, but I do not want you to respond out loud. Okay, please don't respond out loud. So here's the question. What nation or nationality or people group would you say is doing it wrong? Would you say that was like missing the mark? That's like kind of failing right now. Which nation, which people group, which nationality would you say Man, they just are so missing the mark. Now, if we took this survey, I know I'm asking a bunch of people in Renton, Washington. But if we took this survey throughout the world, we'd have all kinds of responses. And some of the responses that I came up with will surprise you. Because if you ask people in certain areas of the world and you said, what nation is really messing things up? You know what they'd say? They would say America. They'd say the United States. And if you ask somebody else from somewhere else, they'd say, well, you know what? Those North Koreans, whoo-wee, mainly their leader. The Chinese are messing things up. The Russians are messing things up. The Ukrainians are messing things up. The Hamas are messing things up. Israel is messing things up. The Muslims are messing things up. The Mormons are messing things up. Guess what? Christians, we mess things up. The Olympic Committee mess things up. The French officials mess things up, if you're following the news lately. White supremacists mess things up. LGBTQ community mess things up. That's just 16. Nations, people groups that have, are messing things up. Depends who you ask. And Jesus says, 
Those are our neighbors. It is hard to get our minds around some of this stuff because we have been so ingrained with certain things over the years, certain thought processes, how we're supposed to feel about other people, how we're supposed to feel about certain groups. And Jesus comes along with this story and literally blows it up. I mean, we read it because we have this side of it. And so now when we think of Samaritans, Samaritans are good. But in the culture of the day, this was, Jesus couldn't have picked a worse hero. He couldn't have. And yet he did. And why? Because he wanted to drive the point home. Everyone is our neighbor. Even people we don't like, they're our neighbor. Staying on the theme of unlikely heroes, and this isn't to be irreverent at all, but you know, Jesus was an unlikely hero. Born in an obscure town, not even given the royal treatment at birth of a king but born in a manger. It's not even Christmas when we're talking about it. Born to a family who didn't have riches. The father was a carpenter. Love carpenters. <laughs> Steel workers. People that work with their hands, you love that. Concrete workers. You love that. Can you imagine the rumors about Jesus' mom's pregnancy. Now, Joseph and Mary weren't married, and yet she's having a baby. And so the rumors that swirl around, and when Jesus grew up in Nazareth and grew up doing what his father did, I mean, he worked in that city until he was 30 years old. They knew Jesus. They knew Jesus didn't just show up and say, ta-da, here I am, I'm the Messiah. Jesus grew up there. He shopped, he bought fruits and vegetables from them. He made their fences and tables and worked on their houses. And the guy who actually built my fence is now claiming to be the Messiah? They knew there was something different about Jesus. But some of them couldn't pinpoint it. And then Jesus makes that profound statement, even a prophet is not welcome in his own home because they did not recognize him as Messiah. They continue to ask for sign after sign. And yet, being unlikely, I mean, Isaiah even says that Jesus wasn't even anything to look at. I mean, we see these amazing pictures of Jesus now. You know, it's just artist renditions of what Jesus looked like. Isaiah said he wasn't anything to look at, meaning he wasn't this handsome, 12-foot monster guy, like, oh, he's a man's man, and he's going to save the world. He was just an average Jewish guy. And yet, he was born to save the world. He came into this world to introduce us to his Father in heaven and to sacrificially die for us so we can have a relationship with God. Jesus says, everyone you come in contact with is your neighbor, and I want your neighbors to know about me. Unlikely heroes. One last story. Okay, almost done. In the early 2000s, Africa was under crisis. And I say that, and most of us are like, well, isn't Africa always under crisis? Parts. But in early 2000s, I mean, we hear famine and we hear the different things. But they had a massive issue going on in the early 2000s that, that rolled all the way up to the mid, uh, about 2015, 2000, whatever. And the effects of this crisis are still happening today. The result of what happened then still affects their, econ their economy today because millions and millions and millions of people were dying. And at first they didn't know why. And then they discovered, oh, it's AIDS. 
We call it the AIDS crisis. It started early in the 2000s, and like one year, one million died. The next year, two and a half million died. And the next year, another two million died. I mean, we can't get, I can't get my mind around a million people gone. But that's what was happening. And it was a weird disease because it was only, it was the middle age that were dying. It was moms and dads that were dying and then all these kids that were being left. Over 11 million orphans. And we wonder how the, one of the missionaries that we support is so powerful. They, support, they, they started off by supporting a small school in Lusaka, Zambia of about 400 orphans because their moms and dads had died of AIDS. And most of them were HIV positive. And what was the response of the American church for the most part? I'm kind of painting with a wide brush on this one. What was the response of the American church? Here's the response. It was zero. You know why? Because of the stigma. Because at the same time, we had people dying in the United States of AIDS. And it wasn't moms and dads. It was gay men. And so what we said was AIDS is a judgment from God. Man, I want to warn us. Those words should never come out of our mouths. <laughs> I mean, the priest and the Levite walking by the Samaritan, hey, that must have been a judgment of God. So I'm not going to help you. It wasn't a gay disease in Africa. It wasn't a moral disease, I'll tell you that. Let's be real. But there was a need. And so World Vision stepped in. No other organization at that time And World Vision stepped in and said, we're going to do something here. And we're going to care for those who are hurting. And we're going to train people to go into their homes and offer some care. Many of them died anyways, but you know what? But they died with people loving them and caring for them. Many gave their hearts to Jesus because the caregivers that were going were believers in Christ. And they would love and care for them. They were good Samaritans. And so World Vision said, hey, let's just figure out what to do. So our own Dana Buck is the one who led up that crew. And he said, we're going to just put these kits together. So we're going to ask you to go to the grocery store and buy three washcloths, buy a bar of soap, buy a flashlight, get two batteries, buy a little thing of Vaseline, you know, and put it in a little clear box. Well, the problem is you ask people to do that. Put it in a little clear box. We were getting boxes this big, this big, this big. No boxes. Half the stuff missing. And so they recruited a guy named Toby Caps to help, who works for the biggest pharmaceutical company in the world. And they together made these kits. And instead of asking you to go to the grocery store, they're basically asking you for cash. And then they're asking you to put these kits together. The first kits ever for that was built here in, the, in RCC. And, the, and they sent them off. And over the next 10 years, 350,000 kits were made, specifically for AIDS patients, to be cared for, to be loved on, to be witnessed and shared with about the love of Jesus. Caregivers who, who didn't even know these people, or maybe they did, but said, I will be your neighbor. I will care for you. And I think one of the biggest fears we have as human beings, I mean, I believe that for every one of us is, is just that whole loneliness factor I mean, there's times where like, hey, would you just leave me alone? I mean, never, never. No. <laughs> okay. But when you see heaven's door, and you know it's not long, 
before you walk into it, or you don't know if that's the right door, and you're alone, that is scary. And so for people to walk alongside you and point you to the right door and pray with you and spend time with you and care for you, that was life-changing. And so my question as we end, would you stand? My question as we end this morning is, who is your Samaritan? Who is your neighbor this morning? And I pray that our hearts would be changed towards the nations, towards the people groups in our community. I pray that, that our eyes would be open, that we would see people the way Jesus sees people, that we would respond to them with love, compassion, healing, and truth. Let's pray. Lord, you responded to us with love and compassion, with healing and truth. And Lord Jesus, I pray that we would respond the same way to those around us who are our neighbors. That we would love them the way you love them that we would have compassion on them the way you have compassion, that we would bring healing in the name of Jesus to them, and that we would speak truth and love. Jesus, we were the beaten ones left on the side of the road as dead. And you came by and had compassion on us. You bandaged us up. You poured your oil and wine over us. You, you carried us and set us in a place that would be safe. God, I pray that you'd remind us often of what you've done for us. And that we would do the same for those around us. As individuals, Lord, I pray that, but Lord, I also pray that for us as a church, but the churches in our area. Use your church, Lord, to bring healing and wholeness to our neighbors. And we pray this in your name. And the church said, Amen. 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 You are loved. You are cared for. You are our neighbor. So thank you. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Okay.